from sunny California. Welcome back to Pucknology Conversations. If the season ended today is something we love to say on the show, well, we're closing in on April. It's getting closer and closer. This is another in a series of interviews focused on the perspectives of bloggers, podcasters, tweeters, and really anyone who follows other playoff hopefuls. If you like this, give it a thumbs up, share it, subscribe, check out all the links in the description. I'll be taking questions on Twitter at ChrisJWS as I line up other guests. So give me all your feedback there, whether you love it, hate it, whatever, it's all good. Our guest today is Joey. He's the host of Brave the Wild. You can check him out at Brave the Wild, all one word, on Twitter. Uh, You can find his cast on iTunes, Double Twist, and Stitcher. The Wild right now are having a hell of a season, currently leading their division in solid playoff position with 80 points and on pace for a franchise record in points. And they're, you know, keep fingers crossed in the conversation for the President's Trophy. Welcome, Joey. How's it going today? Yeah, thank you very much. Nice to meet you, Chris, and great to be on board. Yeah, good to have you. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I mentioned to you before we jumped into this that you know, I lived in Minnesota, and they're kind of a team I like to like to follow a little bit on top of the Sharks, and they're really they're really fun to watch right now. Um, so b- before we get to current events, though, I, I think we do have to t- touch on a trade that went down roughly five years ago that got us a Norris defenseman. I'm curious what what your thoughts are on that trade or what they were at the time and what they are now. Well, quite uh, <laughs> quite an amazing uh, profit for the uh, San Jose Sharks, I'd have to say. I mean, it, it took a little while for him to develop over there, but now look at him. I mean, he's leading you in scoring. It's incredible. Um, it was nice to get Charlie Coyle. He's turned out to be okay, kind of, you know, up and down at times. What, like like I say on my show, hockey is a game of streaks, and Charlie Coyle tends to be that way. He'll get hot, cold. He was obviously a nice prospect for the Sharks, and then, of course, you made that swap. Uh, ultimately, though, I mean, at the time, Brent Burns was kind of looked on as an oft-injured, concussed, you know, like he had a couple concussion issues pop up and inconsistent defensively, and then he goes to San Jose, and look at that. You know, he's just blown up, hasn't he? Yeah, I mean, it did. He did kind of have that similar reputation early on with us, and I mean, there mm-hmm. there were people seriously questioning whether we won that trade up until about three years ago. So it wasn't, you know, it was not a slam dunk from our end until, like, you know, I say recently, the feeling is like, yeah, we definitely feel like we came out really well in that trade, and you know, like you said, Charlie Coyle, really nice. I mean, from what I've seen from afar, I don't know if he's first line guy but he's definitely solid second liner can fill in on the first line kind of guy is that that impression Mm -hmm. about right yeah and it's kind of yeah he can be and he's also versatile he can play center right wing uh sometimes third third line center because with boudreaux it kind of he goes with who's hot right now if if that's been going on in the national media as well he he really goes with the flow during the games um and certain lines, they just work together great. It, it seems like the top three are interchangeable, except for the second line. It's uh, Koivu, Zucker, and, of course, Mikhail Granlin is leading us in scoring. Uh, that, that line has been basically stuck together ever since they were assembled. Just spectacular. But it seemed like first line, third line, it changes all the time. Like with uh, Pominville, Parisi, Coyle, of course, uh, Stahl, Niederreiter, mm-hmm. and... <laughs> It, uh, occasionally like an Alex Tuck or something can move all the way up to the top line. So um, really though, yeah, I mean, Charlie Coyle, I'd say he's a top six guy most of the time, but it seems like with uh, Boudreaux, if Coyle's not playing as well, he'll he'll drop down a bit on occasion, depending on the situation in games. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, that's, it's good to have a guy that was, you know, is like a salt, you know, maybe he's not like a superstar, but he's got, you know, he's, solid piece and he's still a young guy i was like looking at the top mm-hmm. scores on the wild there and looking at the ages and you got a very nice mixture of you know guys from age 23 24 up to guys like 32 33 so really mm-hmm. good mixture of veterans and young guys in that core and that's that's the thing like, i look at that like yeah you guys probably you know i don't know all the finer workings but looks to me like they're going to be good for a while I think they should be, too, because you have a nice uh, group of prospects coming up as well. That seems to be one of the reasons why you're seeing such a surge all of a sudden is 
you have a lot of nice prospects in the system, the Iowa Wild and, you know, overseas and such. I won't quite go in the ECHL. That's kind of a little bit like hockey purgatory for some of these guys, unfortunately, uh, like the, the double A of hockey, we'll call it. Um, but when you have like a Alex Tuck, uh, Eric jo- uh, Yul Erickson, I can pronounce correctly now, uh, others like Mario Lucia and such down in the system, some of these guys have to push harder to, to, to keep their roster spot because there's always that possibility that, they can get flipped down as as some of these guys jump up and develop. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely a perfect mixture of youth and veterans now, where in the past during the Mike Yo era, it seemed like there was a division between the youth and the veterans because Yo would lean on the veterans, and the young guys, just that didn't sit too well with them. So you'd say Boudreaux's done a pretty good job of kind of balancing the two because I know that that always does seem to be saying, you know, we've seen, I've seen that with the Sharks firsthand as well, where mm-hmm. it's like you have, you have to get the right blend. It's not just having those young guys and those veteran guys. It's a coach being able to manage them in a way that everybody stays focused, everybody stays on board. Mm-hmm. That, that's pretty much what it's about, and Boudreaux – he seems to have that magic touch where he he manages players perfectly. He kind of gets to know them, uh, their tendencies, their mental st- status, so to speak, uh, how they how they handle different situations. And he seems to have that magic touch right now, of pressing the right buttons with uh, mixing veterans and and uh, and the uh, younger players. For sure. Um, so mm-hmm. let's let's uh, jump a little bit to talk uh, about the division. We'll we'll touch on Boudreau a little bit more in a few minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, looking at the standings today, St. Louis and Nashville are both about ten points back, and really haven't shown signs of being able to string together a large amount of wins right now. Like from my perspective, it looks like it's really a two-team race between Minnesota and Chicago. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you agree with that? And how do you see the division playing out? Right now, absolutely, at this stage, Minnesota, Chicago, and ironically, Mike Yo took over the St. Louis Blues, so they're starting to play a little better. Uh, it, to me, it's just amazing, because in the past, you would have saw Minnesota, St. Louis, Nashville down there, and or let's just say Minnesota, Nashville kind of fighting down there. St. Louis would be battling with Chicago, but right now, I'd have to say it's definitely between the Wild and the Blackhawks, because I, I don't really see that that uh, mid-season uh, swoon that, that tend to take place every season in December, January under Mike Yo. And then St. Louis, I mean, you never know. There might be a little surge because Mike Yo is capable of that sometimes. And obviously it's a very talented team with uh, Tarasenko and such. Uh, their goaltending situation is not up to par at all in St. Louis right now. Uh, Jake Allen always looked on as the goalie of the future. They, they trade away Brian Elliott and all of a sudden he's not fighting for his job anymore. And now it's been a struggle. Uh, Hutton stepped up a bit, a little, I would have to say. So, but at this stage, I'd say they're a little too far behind to compete with uh, Minnesota, Chicago. It's going to be a nice battle between these clubs. Yeah, I figure it would take either them getting really hot or Minnesota and Chicago both getting really cold at the same mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Um, on the subject of Chicago, so you know, looking back, so prior to last year's three straight years, Minnesota season ended against Chicago. And I was just curious to look back to see, you know, how they've done against them in the regular season around the same span. And actually, I found, you know, this year it, they're one zero and one. We can't read too much into. By the time this airs, they'll have played one more time. So no one correct me on that. Um, mm-hmm. But um, eleven six and one in the previous five years was it four years or five years, whichever um, that I compiled. Mm-hmm. Actually, no, four years. Okay, but they're eleven six and one over that span against Chicago, which seemed odd to me that they were really good against them in the regular season, but seemingly struggled so much in the playoffs against them. Yeah, it's the old regular season for a show and postseason for dough, as they say. <laughs> That's what some people say in, uh, locally here. Uh, it's kind of like, it, yeah, it's like we dominate them in the regular season, here come the playoffs, and then it's just a clean sweep. You just can't believe it. After the wild, nice, impressive series against St. Louis. This was two years ago at the – uh, Devin, uh, Devin Dubnik trade, sorry. Uh, nice little six-game win for the Wild. And then you run into Chicago, and it's just a buzzsaw. Um, it, it's some kind of a mental advantage, and plus the fact Chicago's got that top-heavy deal, Kane and Taves. Uh, it's kind of like almost nothing you can do about it. And the next thing you see is uh, anytime you see Patrick Kane loose with a puck, it's like, here we go again. <laughs> and that's kind of been the case here in Minnesota. All like the Yankees and Twins type of domination we had in the Ron Garden era. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and they wouldn't be the only team that would struggle against Chicago in the recent era. I mean, Chicago, 
their well, success speaks for itself. So I don't, I don't think that's necessarily anything to be ashamed of. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was just curious to me because I was like looking at that. I was like, I figured it would probably be a, you know more in Chicago's favor. But like you said, you know, regular season playoffs, it's it's a different animal. Um, so I mean, we can't take the first round for granted. But the way it's playing out right now, it looks like you guys are on a collision course for maybe what might be a second round matchup. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about that series this year versus other years? I'm still a, still a little scared, a little skeptical. Uh, I do see more mental toughness of this club than we saw in the past, so I'm hopeful in that sense. Uh, at the beginning of the season, I just felt different because adding a new coach and such, I didn't know how strong the success rate would be, but I figured it would be significant. And I did predict the Wild get past Chicago this year. It might have been just wishful thinking, hopeful, home, homerism, all that. But I think they can. It's going to be tight, though. I, I could see six, seven games, uh, bounce of the puck here and there. It's, boy, it, it, you know, I mean, until we do it, it's kind of like convince me type of thing, I would have to say. Yeah, that's how I felt with the Sharks last year when it came to the playoffs. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm sure you're familiar with our playoff history and why Sharks fans are very bitter and cynical when it comes to anything playoffs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was nice to see you get out of the West last year. I was hoping you're going to beat Pittsburgh, but Pittsburgh was just on a mission, I suppose, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and then the whole St. Louis series, I mean, that was nice domination by San Jose. It was, it was, it was nice to see you guys break through last year. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun, and yeah, it you know it was unfortunate how it ended, but it was it was yeah. a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, so, as far as playoffs go, how how do you feel about Bedros playoff history? Because I'm I'm sure you you probably had this question brought up to you many times. Mm -hmm. The old seven game curse. <laughs> yep. That's the thing. Yeah, I mean he's had some success. He's won a seventh game before, believe it or not, in the past, but but only one. Um, the one thing, it's the old something's got to give because the Wild are perfect in seven-game series, believe it or not, 3-0 uh, and oh over the years. You had uh, them beat Colorado. This was back in 03, though, but still, it's some kind of a mental thing, you could say. Um, and then they beat uh, Vancouver in a seven-game series. They, they had trailed three games to one in both of those series, believe it or not. And then you beat Colorado in the seven-game series, and it looked like they're going to lose that one. Um, all on the road, by the way, too. So... The hope is uh, the the second Colorado one is what I'm trying to say. Uh, a couple of years ago, 2014, um, and then of course you run into Chicago, which was a much better series than the following year. Uh, it's something's got to give. The Wild perfect in seventh games. Boudreaux struggled. Uh, he has gotten far. Of course, he he lost to the the Blackhawks in the seventh game. Uh, unfortunately for him, a couple of years back in the conference final. So that's the farthest he's gotten. The hope is. Can he break through? I, I'm hopeful coming in because of the Wilds' history at least once. So, again, it's a it's a hopeful thing, I'd, I'd have to say, kind of like with Chicago. Yep. I mean, you kind of just have to hope for the best and enjoy the ride while it goes on, right? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So, um, you know, when I, when I look at the Sharks and I'm going to – caveat this recently this hasn't been as true but you know their their defense and goaltending has probably been their biggest asset for most of the season not so much lately and then special teams their biggest liability which is definitely still a thing right now mm -hmm. uh in, in the playoffs what would you consider to be the wilds key asset key liability key liability uh backup goaltending for one if we ever had to go that direction it's scary obviously like do mix kind of this lights out you know star goalie you have to hope for health all that with him you know like no freak injury anything um the power play has been so much better the penalty kill has been good i'd have to say it's overall you know what scares me the most is running into a hot goaltender because this club if a goalie's playing well it's just you know it, it seems like their scoring can it, it can be inconsistent at times like they'll have this five goal game against pittsburgh which will surprise everybody and then the next night they lose one nothing. They lose two to one. So it's kind of the inconsistency of the offense in general. I'd have to say, like you run into a goalie that's that's on his game that night, and things can change dramatically for this club. I'd, I'd have to say that's my my biggest scare coming in. Other than maybe another team is like a Pittsburgh. They're just faster. They're on a mission, and there's almost nothing you can do about it. Yeah, Pittsburgh is pretty scary. Um, mm -hmm. 
so you know every year the playoffs always produce some uh, unlikely heroes so um mm -hmm. i always i always like to ask this question of anyone we have on here but um you know aside from the big names who would you pick as your guy who might be the under the radar who's that guy who makes who could make a big contribution in the playoffs who's a guy that probably may people who haven't followed the wild really closely haven't heard of mm -hmm. that is, you know that could come out of nowhere for me it'd be eric holla uh because obviously people know koi Vu, all of them you know eric stahl of course you know carolina hurricanes uh neither writers emerged but he's got the history with the uh you know the, the game winning goal against chicago and in and out sucker all them but I'd have to say, yeah, Eric Halla, he's got that little speed. Uh, he's capable of getting shorthanded goals, nice defensive center. Of course, former uh, Minnesota Gopher, believe it or not, in the seventh round. Um, yeah, he, he's, he's the kind of guy he can change He can change things. And I remember a couple of years ago in that whole Colorado-Chicago year, 2014, he really stepped up out of nowhere. And people were very happy. They were super op optimistic coming into the next season and then kind of went downhill a little bit. So... That's a guy I would I would look at is Eric Halla. Hmm. Interesting, you know, to take a look because mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I looked at you know obviously the top guys and a little less familiar with some of the other guys down the in the, you know lower lines and system. Um, mm -hmm. So how for Eric Stahl? Let's talk about him real quick. Mm -hmm. um, how, his level of play this year. Were you a believer when he came in, or ha has he changed your your opinion as the season has gone on? It was kind of a wait and see type of thing because of the significant drop off. But again, hopeful. Uh, you know, the Bruce Boudreaux's success rate over the course of the last several years of the division championships. I just had a good feeling about that. Uh, and plus, the the addition of Eric Stahl helped really organize things here. Uh, you get to you get a chance to move Grandland over to the wing as he'd been a, a second line center, even top line center at times with different lines. Uh, a couple of years ago, Parisi, Pomondrel, Grand was a crazy good line. And then it kind of, you know, shipped it off a bit. Uh, so bringing in Eric Stahl there, you finally have this number one center. As long as he's up up to it, you can uh, send Koivu down to the second line. Uh, Grandland to the wing, like I was mentioning, you can put Coyle at the wing or center, depending on the situation. And then, yeah, I mean, it really helped uh, cause a domino effect that really improved the depth of this club. So... For me, I was very actually encouraged about that coming in. Yeah, I mean, we've seen the same thing, you know, with the Sharks over the years is there's a lot of, like, sometimes certain guys are more important than others, even if they're not as good. It's just they fit, they allow people to fit in their right places. Like, you know, when Paul Martin was injured, mm -hmm. you know, slotting Brent Burns, the different guy, like Paul Martin is the, you know, we call him the Burns whisperer because mm. he kind of, when Burns really started turning his game on was when Paul Martin got there and was really the guy who stabilized that pair and turned it from a defensive liability that could produce offense to, well, less of a defensive liability that could produce a lot of offense. Yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> a lot, lining, lining things up like that makes a huge difference, we found. Um, yeah, he's nice. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, sorry. I was going to say Paul Martin. Yeah, well, that was a really nice addition. Um, and, and of course, he was another Gopher player. Helped us win a national championship with the you know Gopher men's team. Um, nice defensive player. Uh, that was a that was a solid addition. I'm sure you're definitely liking him. Oh yeah, it was it was one of those ones like it was very under the radar and. I don't think many people were super excited when we first got him, but mm -hmm. you know, as first few months of them together happen, we're like, okay, we can we could see we could see that there's a difference in Burns' game, and maybe maybe we're not giving Burns enough credit for what he did himself, but mm -hmm. uh, the feeling was like Martin had a lot to do with that big step forward he took. Um, so you know, I was talking about a couple other wild players here. So um, Granlund having his career year. Um, I believe he, he was recently moved from uh, center to wing, right? Yep, yep, over to the um, the right wing, yep. Do, do you feel the same thing happens if he doesn't uh, get moved, or do you think he was already kind of just set to emerge like that? Kind of both, I'd say. I, I would say the wing really has helped him a bit. He doesn't have to focus quite as much on basically being everywhere like a center has to be. And you have a big, tough guy like Koivu as a center. It allows Granlin to be more of that skilled playmaker type, and he is a good two-way forward. Uh, Granlin. It's just 
it frees him up more. Uh, he's, he's good on the wall and such, believe it or not. And his his passing from those angles was spectacular. Him and Zucker and Koi have been a great uh, combination. And also the situation with the defense, and like you were saying, too, with Martin and uh, Burns, it, it really does matter. Like we have a guy who's capable of some offensive capability. If you can put him with an anchor defenseman, it's, you know, great combination. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, combinations are every bit as important as production. Um <laughs> And so, I mean, looking forward, you know, and you have to resign Granlin and Niederreiter. Um, mm-hmm. If if shedding salary is required, who who do you think could be the guys that might end up having to leave? Uh, well, it's scary to think. <laughs> yeah, it's a, um, it it kind of comes in with the whole Vegas situation too, I suppose. A lot of people would have liked to uh, let Pominville go at one point because, but still, it's too hard to. Too hard to buy him out. His contract's too big. It's too much, uh, too much money basically, and it doesn't help the salary cap situation. Scandella on defense is one of the more likely guys you might have to lose one way or the other. Um, plus, you got prospects coming up. It seems most of them are kind of signed uh, are signed to long term deals. Uh, some of the some of the big name guys, unfortunately. Um, boy, if somebody has to go, it's a really tough choice for this organization. Uh, Zucker, you want to keep so badly with how well he's doing at the line, but not sure. Uh, Granlund, I think if you have to keep one of the young guys, I, I'd have to say it, it has to be Granlund over, say, Niederreiter, even Zucker at this point. Yeah, totally. totally interesting. And Sharks are in a similar <laughs> situation lately with the cat. They have been riding against the cap this entire season and trying to figure mm-hmm. out how they're going to Managed to resign Joe Thornton and maybe Patrick Marlowe, and then they have Mark Edward Vlasic coming up for a deal, and yeah, because they've had him at a bargain price. So yeah, it's navigating the cap is hard, especially when you're not the the Penguins or the Blackhawks. Mm-hmm. Um, so on this on a similar kind of thing. So Parise, I was looking at his numbers. He's on pace for what will be his least productive year since his rookie year, although his minutes are also down, which might have some effect on that. Uh, mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on his play this year? And then I believe he's under contract for another eight years, I think. It is about that. Yeah, I, th- ah, I forget exactly now. So twenty, so it's 13 from, say, 2012. So, yeah, it could be. Yeah. Oh, my God, that's a while. It is about eight more years. Man. <laughs> but... Um, a lot of it started last year, believe it or not, too, with the you know the, the back injury. A lot of us were wondering, what is going on? You're not seeing the same guy anymore, and a back can be so immobilizing, especially with his style. He likes to really get up there, get his nose right right into the, the, the goalie pretty much, So and he gets banged around and all that. Uh, he seems to be a lot healthier. He's been playing significantly better the last month. But really, you could kind of fall it partially with the back injury, then some kind of me- mental stuff going on in the past with Mike Yo. Him and Mike Yo, I don't think we're seeing eye to eye at all last year. You could definitely sense that. Um, and Boudreau and him kind of, you know, like Boudreau was getting frustrated with his inconsistent play earlier in the season. And you saw him get down to the third line, which is unheard of a couple of years ago. Um, but he, he has been picking it up of late. Still, unfortunately, st- statistically, I don't, I don't see him catching up to his uh, previous seasons. But again, it's like you could kind of chalk it up mostly to back injuries, and uh, at this point, and also he was sick for a while too. Hmm. Yeah. So I, I know I pick good questions when they get mentioned before I even bring them up. But uh, how, oh, how do you <laughs> feel about how you feel about the backup goaltending situation? Because last year for the Sharks, one of the most important things down the stretch was getting James Reimer and getting Jones rest and not burning Jones out. Uh, how, how do you feel as, you know, down the stretch as far as getting Dubnik rest and making sure he's fresh when it comes to playoff time? Uh, it's very important definitely to get him that rest. Uh, Darcy Kemper, boy, <laughs> he's had some – He, he uh, talk about inconsistent. He'll have some games where he looks like a world beater. He looks like a stone wall, you could say. And then – He'll give up four or five goals, so it, it is scary at this point. Uh, if anything, I wish, I wish you could, I wish we could do this. Is call up Alex Stalock, the guy you're familiar with in San Jose. Uh, uh, a, a bit, somewhat, <laughs> I don't yeah. want to do that. <laughs> oh yeah, he had some. <laughs> he had some good. Yeah, he had one good year and then dropped off, didn't he? So, yeah, last year he was the guy we shipped out when we uh, got Reimer because. 
Mm. He was, yeah, early. I mean, and maybe maybe he's gotten better. Maybe he'll do better now. Yeah, that was that was the guy that we're like, we can't start him because he just mm. he was pr- pretty much a given to let in four or five goals. Mm. And given, I mean, the defense in front of him had something to do with it too, but mm-hmm. very very inconsistent. And yeah, then Reimer came in at the trade deadline and was a rock rock solid guy. I mean, him and Jones were nearly like. 40 60 towards the end of the season there kind of catch up jones on some of the rest he didn't get in you know october through january mm-hmm. yeah i mean I, that's there's nothing better than having a good goalie tandem going into the postseason it helped the wild in that 2003 run um that had to yeah i mean that did that play did help the sharks last year uh for me darcy kemper again it's just you just hope for the best he's not the best that's for sure um I think he was – wasn't he playing against the Blackhawks uh, last week, I think? Or was that Dubnik yep. in there? Yeah, it, it was. Yeah, it was kind of like a test. Like, can this guy do it? It was kind of – it really was a test. And, of course, national media took it the wrong way. Like, the Wild are cocky. They're just – you know, like, we don't need uh, a starting goalie against Chicago. We, we can we can figure things out. But, really, it was a test to see if Darcy Kemper's up to the challenge, ultimately. And he, he was all right. He was solid. It was one of his decent games. Unfortunately, he's – you, you know, you, you give up the goal in overtime. So, yeah, I mean, I couldn't blame him too much on that. So, yeah, I watched most of the yeah. game and looked really good. And yeah, I was thinking it was him because mm-hmm. uh, that didn't quite jive with my impression looking at the numbers and looking at the sentiments around him. Seemed like he was did not have a lot of confidence. But then I saw that game and I saw, you know, one that they started him and two that he played, you know, he, he, he wasn't the reason why they lost that game, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, Obviously, you know they need to get more pucks past Crawford. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean it seems yeah it's it's it seems like you're in a little better situation than the Sharks were last year with goaltending. But mm-hmm. yeah, that, that kind of like can't you know will we will we get good Kemper or bad Kemper? It's kind of a question there. Um, yep. So current events, real quick. What are your feelings on the the Nyquist suspension? Uh, I guess it's a. I guess it's enough. I mean, uh, most of us would rather see like ten games because it it was intentional, uh, and and it's sad too when it's the kind of guy that would never do that, and and it always seems that way, doesn't it? It's always like ah, oh, he'd never do that, and then all of a sudden he spe- spears the guy in the cheek. Um, uh, I I wish it was a ten gamer. I think. Yeah, I I assume that's why. Uh, that's why it is. You didn't have the track record, and I think. Someone also said, I don't know what the number of games is, but I believe for certain, you know, certain forms of appeal that I think it was the most they could give him without allowing him an easier way to appeal. But uh, I mean, yeah, I don't think anyone argued with six or 10. Yeah. And I, I, I thought it was going to, I thought it was going to be 10, but mm-hmm. six, I mean, you know, we have, we have a joke that we're like, you know, if it was Rafi Torres, it would be like <laughs> three years. Yep. Yeah. It, it's, it, it is a reputation thing. No doubt. <laughs> Oh yeah, no Re- reputation plays into it, and of course track record. Because yeah, we got ups- you know some people got upset years ago when Torres got suspended uh, forty one games here, but a lot of us were just like, well, you know, <laughs> you kind of have a track record a mile long when it comes to this. So can you really blame them? So uh, I usually wrap these up by asking what's a what's a good place to get a beer before a game. I know a lot of the spots there, but maybe maybe you can uh, maybe you can surprise me with one. Uh, what's what's your place of choice to go before a wild game? For me, it would be uh, it would be Tom Reed's. I'd have to say uh, I I like the food there, and then you know the beer selection is decent. Um, of course, I mean for me, I like I, I'm generally more of a just go to the liquor store and get a good craft beer. But still, you know, but um, yeah, if you're going to the game, yeah, for me, Tom Reed's. I mean that's. Probably way that's probably way too basic because I mean I I don't know St. Paul super well I, I have to admit it's like I, I generally just go there for the wild if I'm gonna go there um, unless some some other type of you know uh, appointment or something yeah for sure and yeah you guys the the beer scene there I mean I wish we had the beer scene there that five years ago when I was there because it's mm. yeah it's exploding there's a lot really really good beer there in Minnesota right now. Mm-hmm. You got Surly, you got, uh, you know, obviously, uh, what's the main one? Now I'm blanking. Summit. Summit's been around forever. Um, Surly well, not- is my favorite. The, the, if you've been to the brewery, it's mm-hmm. that's, that place is a palace. 
it's unbelievable, isn't it? Certainly, like darkness. That's like a cult following for that one. The the uh, uh, imperial stout they come out every Halloween. Yep, I've got I've gotten that a few times. I haven't actually gone to Darkness Day, but I have gotten that a few times. I have a lot a lot of friends out there in Minnesota who uh, are very good good people and send me stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I like the beer in California too. Like, uh, you know, Sierra Nevada is one of my all time favorites. And then Alesmith too. Oh, yeah. Those and, are yeah. Great. You guys just got that last year, I think, right? Yeah. Oh, I was, I was shocked. I'm like, oh my God, Speedway Stout. <laughs> I was so happy. Oh, saw that very nice. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even, I didn't even hear that it was finally coming. And then there it was on the shelf. Like, wow. <laughs> Yeah, I saw. Yeah, I was, I was out there like right when they were launching all their stuff and had a bunch of Ale Smith events at like all the different places and stuff. And yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, there's a lot of people I know out there who are also big beer fans. So it was mm -hmm. cool to kind of like say, hey, try this stuff from California. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. It really is too. The uh, Bloody Valentine. I'm I missed out on that this year. It wasn't it wasn't there. I kept looking for it, but I don't know. Maybe it's still hanging around somewhere. I hope. Yeah, it's also things that, you know, if it's not the primary market, sometimes it lags or, you know, you, you know I'm sure you, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, you, you, get, you get to have all that awesome Minnesota beer, so I, I'm jealous. Uh, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I, do, I do love me some Toddy Axeman. Mm -hmm. Which one? Or? Uh, Toddy Axeman from Surly. Oh, yeah, 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 yep. Yeah, that's kind of the Imperial IPA, I believe. Uh, yep, 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 that's, uh, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. um so just wrapping up here um you know let the folks know where they can find you as far as your cast twitter and all that um yeah but it's at brave the wild for twitter facebook is facebook.com forward slash brave the wild and then of course it's all on itunes stitcher double twist um there's always a there's a call in line on the facebook page they could just hit the call now button so the things like that obviously other like email address phone number are on the uh in the uh, show description so awesome cool so yeah mm -hmm. everyone check his stuff out check the wild out because yeah they're having they're having a great season they're really fun to watch right now mm -hmm. um if you are new here subscribe if you're listening on audio subscribe there as well subscribe everywhere really um <laughs> We uh, appreciate you joining us, and we appreciate everyone out there for listening. 